Okay, welcome back. We'll continue on where we were started. We were on chapter 13, looking at setting boundaries. Uh, through this chapter, we were um, we initially spent some time understanding how being married doesn't isolate us from uh, other emotional affections and how uh, we looked at the progression of how emotional entanglement and sexual relationships adultery can go about. We looked at scripture, looked at a few instructions about what scripture talks about, some insights from David's life, uh, looking at some verses in Proverbs uh, on to seeing what adultery does and uh, certain um, uh, instructions for women as well. Now, we're going to be focusing on the second part of it as to what happens or what should be done once uh, once someone has engaged in an adulterous relationship, okay? Uh, in case a husband or a wife has fallen into an emotional relationship and then that has led or, or even led to adultery, um, engaged in a, in a sexual relationship as well, what is the way out, okay? Uh, so, from, sorry. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Okay, my mom. Yeah, so um, uh, when we're looking at, uh, um, at, at what we read from scripture, uh, yeah, what we read from scripture, we know and we we see that um, there is no sin or nothing that is too hard or too difficult for our Lord to restore and to redeem. No matter how much we would have fallen, how much we have gone away from his plan, from him, from what he desires of us, Scripture shows us that if we are willing to repent, if we are willing to come back to God, ask him for his help, he is able to redeem us. He is able to restore us. He is able to help us recover. Okay? So you can definitely come back strong, okay, because of what the Lord has done for us because of his work for us on the cross, because of the sin that he's taken away on our behalf, we can come back. We can, we have that place of forgiveness, okay? Um, I'd just like to read from Micah chapter seven, verses seven and eight. It says, as for me, I look to the Lord for his help. I wait confidently for God to save me and my God will certainly hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemies, for though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord himself will be my light. And that's the, um, uh, that's the, the, the comfort we have, that when we repent, when we truly repent, confess of our sins, God takes us back. Um, we also understand the love of the Father, and one of the uh, parables that Jesus spoke about was the prodigal son. Okay, and we see what Jesus uh, what Jesus shares about, and, and through that entire parable talks about. The... Took everything from his father, um, uh, you know, spent it all, uh, and and came back. Uh, in in a state back to his father and we see how the father accepted the love of the father immediately took back the prodigal son so once the prodigal son understood that there is so much in his father's house there is so much uh, that there is in his father's house he decides to return to his father's house okay um and he and when he came in his mind he um uh, the, the thing that he was prepared for was to live like a servant in his father's house. But he was definitely, um, uh, he didn't expect what he would see. 
you know, after having uh, lost everything, scoundered away everything that his father gave him, he was preparing for uh, for some uh, for a for a receiving in shame and humiliation, maybe a scolding or a chiding. That's what he was expecting, but the opposite happened he was he was just he he came with arms open wide you know that it was a love that was most unexpected and you see how the father um, receives him throws a celebration throws a feast puts on a robe puts on a ring and uh, and you know exclaims to everyone calls everyone and celebrates his coming right and this parable is there for us to understand, uh, uh, it, it pictures for us what, what God has done for us, um, how the love of the Father is for us, that when we return to him in our shame, in our humiliation, in everything that we've done, it is the Father's love that is greater and stronger than the shame or the humiliation we may face. So we see that nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us. And we can be sure of this, that when we return, like the, like the prodigal son, we are brought back to the Lord. He is there to welcome us. So even in a place of adulterous sin, it is the Father's love. When we repent, it is the Father's love that, that calls us back, that brings us back and welcomes us. Okay, We also do see that the Lord is the one who restores our soul from every uh, uh, from every sin that has happened. He is the one who restores us because he is the good shepherd. We read this in Luke chapter fifteen that he is our shepherd. Like when even the sheep when they go astray uh, and we have not gone we have gone away, it is the Lord who returns us to him. So he's the one who restores us, who makes us complete and whole again. And it is this assurance that we have that when we return to him, when we do return to him, he is the one who is able to mend us and make us whole and restore us. OK, um, as we as we keep uh, 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 looking at it, we also see that it is it is the uh, it is the, the Holy Spirit, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that turns things around for us. Okay, If you look in Isaiah 61 verse 3, it, it brings about how um, the Holy Spirit is there to give beauty for ashes, um, uh, the uh, joy for mourning, praise for heaviness. Um, and you know that that's that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That that's what the Holy Spirit can do in our life. He can turn everything that's been shameful, everything that's been broken down. That's what He changes for us. He turns our mourning into dancing. He turns our uh, gives us a, 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 a garment of gladness for. For, for the sackcloth that we've put on. That's again, we read that in Psalms. So it is out of the ashes because of the power of the Holy Spirit, we rise up, we rise up. We're no more there uh, da down in the dirt and the dumps, but we are there with beauty, okay? Uh, so this, this is the hope that we uh, as believers, or this is the hope that we can give people who fall into such sin. Now, when we, when a person does fall into adultery, uh, it it is like coming into a trap. Okay, it's like being caught, and um, it's it's important that we we set uh, that that we are set free. Okay, and that that the Lord sets us free. That He He brings us out from that place of of a trap. Who you know that takes us out from that place of prison. And he has promised that he will open those prison doors. But if in order for us to do that, it is a place of repentance. It's a place where we, we may need to come to a place of recovery. Now, this recovery is is doesn't happen in a minute. It happens through small incremental steps. It's small steps that brings us to a place of freedom. Now, whatever the kind of sin maybe now we are specifically talking about adultery here it's it's a journey that it's a it's a step that makes 
it a journey, right? So one step at a time is where you're able to fulfill uh, your journey. So every step that you take is a step that takes towards freedom. So what are the some of the steps that uh, you know we begin to take? So the first one is to call, to identify that we are in sin, which means calling sin as sin and not normalizing um, uh, this, this um, not normalizing the act in itself or not defending it or not justifying it or not rationalizing and saying, OK, this wouldn't have happened if my spouse was such and such or if this wouldn't have happened if I had this kind of a relationship or if or, or a marriage. So uh, these these begin to become lies. These begin to become like deceptions and lies. Um, uh, but when you still build on that lies, it continues to um, feed into the adulterous relationship. Okay, uh, because uh, lies kind of becomes like a cover. The deceptions become like a cover, saying that it's okay or you were justified for doing that. But sin is sin. Okay, and uh, it it cannot be justified. And we are. Uh, we are in the presence of God to to really answer Him. So the first thing, the first step is to identify that that sin is sin, calling it for what it is, and also getting rid of lies or deceptions and not going into a place of rationalizing, justifying, defending, or finding excuses because all of this becomes like a cover. So first is calling sin a sin. Second is to get rid of the lies. Um, or the deceptions that are there. The third is to recognize what's caused the sin. Okay, recognizing number one how serious it is um, uh, uh, that you have fallen into, what you have fallen into, and how uh, or what has really ruined uh, ruined this relationship, ruined your life, ruined the connection that you have with your spouse. There must be an understanding of what. Uh, what caused this? Okay, uh, uh, so it it is important that a person comes to a place of remorse and uh, and and to a place of um, uh, repentance. Okay, because it is from that place that a person takes responsibility uh, uh, in, into into changing things. So even scripture in two Corinthians seven ten it says that remorse and pain is good. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. So it says remorse is good because godly sorrow it is that sorrow that you feel that brings about repentance. If there isn't that place of sorrow, then uh, you know, it, it doesn't move you to a place of repentance. That's when there is justification, things like that, that happens. So there must be repentance and taking responsibility of what has gone wrong. So taking that responsibility and saying, you know, I have sinned. I've recognized that I have sinned and it's been my selfishness or it's been my, um, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my inability to build on this relationship it needs to, the person needs to be responsible and the fourth one which is a difficult step is to cut off is to break off the ties uh, with the person that you may that the person may be having an adulterous um, relationship with to breaking it off to break off that entanglement um, so that you will be free you can't expect to have the relationship going and experience freedom or experience um uh, uh, cutting or uh, experiencing a, a place of being set free, right? So this this becomes a difficult and a challenging step, but it has to be done. It has to be cut off. Every kind of entanglement needs to be cut off. Okay. Now, how do we deal with this sin? How do you cut off to break free? And let's uh, let's just look at um, uh, Matthew chapter five, verse twenty-seven to thirty. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Can somebody please read that, please? Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Prabhu, can you please read Matthew 5, 27 to 30?
Okay, can anyone else please read it? You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gorge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Thank you, Jacqueline. So if when we look at these verses, it's actually teaching us how we should be dealing with sin. So Lord, through the example of adultery, teaches us how to deal with sin. Okay. Um, and if when, when we look in through these verses, we also do understand that just a physical sexual relationship is just not is not the only thing that's considered as adultery, adultery, even an emotional connection, emotional relationship with someone apart from your spouse is considered here as adultery. OK, uh, uh, so it, the idea is whatever it is, whether it's by by thought or by deed, the desire to have, the desire to keep as one's own is, is the same as actually the, des uh, the desire to, um, uh, to, to, be, to be physically connected, okay? Now, this has to be dealt with, whether it's emotional or whether it is um, uh, physical. Uh, it, the, the verses describe that it has to be cut off. So when you look at verse 29, it says, if your eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. All right. Now, what it means, again, it's, it's not a literal taking out, but it is being completely, um, uh, it's, it's a cutting off of anything that is bringing about sin. It's a willful, intentional cutting off, or what we say is an amputation. An amputation is when you cut off some part of that body that is that is probably diseased or that which is is a rotting right so when you do understand that the relationship rots you you cut it off you it is a it is a severing off of that which causes you to causes you to sin so it requires that amputation and it has to be done um uh, uh, definitely there is that there, there may not be any other way you can't find uh, a different way to deal with it it has to be cut off okay then what what is the next thing to do uh, also like we said being able to recognize what led you to that sin okay so uh, sometimes it is uh, it is you recognize it and then you you turn it back you reverse some of those choices so it could it could have been where you spend a lot of time with the person in question or it could have been um uh, communicating with them, it may be traveling with them on work, it may be spending coffee coffee breaks alongside with them. So whatever it is uh, that that has probably led you to uh, to experience um, uh, connection with this person, maybe an emotional pouring out, all of that you recognize what it is and reverse some of those choices that you have made. Also you're also going to beware of the deceptions and the lies that Satan brings about, okay? That makes you feel, uh, you know, especially when emotions are so heightened, these things, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's just one call. I'll just check how the person's doing, or this is the last time I'm going to meet them. Those kind of compromises or those kind of accommodations that you make will, uh, you know, will, will definitely bring sin crouching back into your life again so if if it is even a small thing it has the potential to hold on at a greater level to you so not giving the enemy any access or any foothold in your life right to not permitting even that small thought or that small gesture or that small action that will help that makes you tolerate it so whatever you tolerate as it says will will dominate you so having absolutely no tolerance for any kind of a connection, association, contact with the person, knowing that it is going to be, it is going to help or benefit you. The last one is, yes, to get help, to get 
help from a counselor, to get help from a spiritual leader or a pastor that will help you through this. It's important to be accountable to someone, to be honest, to be uh, to to keep reporting back to someone, especially when this cutting away is is happened. Because as and more you do it, you will e you will eventually be able to manage to get away from it completely. So getting the support of the help. So how do we deal with sin? One, it requires a cutting off. It requires an amputation. The second, recognize what is it that's led you to sin and reverse some of those choices. Third is to being uh, to being aware uh, of of the deceptions of the lies Satan becomes, and fourth is getting any support or help from other people, maybe a, a pastor or a spiritual mentor or a counselor. Okay, uh, any questions up until now before we move on uh, to the two last portions of it? Any question? Come on, students. I'm sure there may be some things that's in your mind and. Uh, let's let's make the class a little bit more, not just a monologue. Let's have some dialogue here. Come on, students. Any any question? Any thoughts? Any maybe things you have seen or things uh, you've come across? Um, anything? Nobody? No thoughts? No no reflections? OK, so then maybe I think I just want maybe five, five minutes. Hello, I'm I'm so sorry. I think my connection went off for a bit. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me now? Okay, all right. I'm so sorry. My power, I lost power. All right. Okay, so we were looking at um, yeah. So my question was, what what should happen? How how does uh, let's say the adultery has been found in in a couple who are believers what do you think should happen uh how should a, a rejoining or how should uh, how should a reconnection happen what are your thoughts what do you think
Okay, now I'll have to start calling out names because no one's talking. I, I think it's not so easy to accept the fact, but uh, once, uh, because both of them are believers, so uh, when the other person comes to know, immediately they should go to God and, be, and ask God to help them out and come out of the hurt. Because the hurt is so bad because it's like it's a lifelong commitment and we are committed to each other so the other person actually feels the hurt and they mm. are definitely going to feel that so they have mm. to take them to god or they can go to somebody who's very close maybe a friend or sister or mm -hmm. uh, they think they can trust the matter mm. with mm. but not share with everyone and okay. Especially based on uh, certain uh, things that others have shared with me, if it mm -hmm. goes to parents, sometimes it goes really bad. Mm -hmm. so that is one thing they have to watch for. But otherwise, mm -hmm. between them and God, because only God can heal them out of that hurt. Because it's like mm -hmm. and emotions. Especially in, in India, I feel when it's emotional thing, the parents themselves see, oh, no, no, you keep it to yourself. Don't tell anyone. And... You know, they mm. fear sisters and they're not speaking about that victim, whoever is going through that. They don't want mm -hmm. to help that person. But whatever I've seen is like, they are important. They give importance to the society and what others think rather mm -hmm. than help person. But that person really needs help. Mm. So, mm. Otherwise, it can go from bad to worse. When the person comes to know, if that person doesn't know how to deal with it, then it can go to uh, from bad to worse. So that's what... Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jackin. For thanks for uh, sharing your insight. Okay. What about the others? Those in the Bible College, any one of you? What are your thoughts? Any one of you can speak for the rest. Uh, I'm, I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are. Anand, is that you? And Francis, man. Francis, yeah. Go ahead, Francis. So it's like in ministry life and uh, uh, physical life is adult is on married person uh, going to adult is uh, to bad and this uh, spouse can't be uh, accept that if she mm. that is a uh, a good uh, spouse and. Uh, it's like not uh, going with the worldly will. She, she or he, can't accept that. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, then, and adultery is like everybody have a physical uh, weakness. If that person is going to that will is uh, from my side, my object, uh, my uh, saying is this: is like don't do that. And from coming out of that. Uh, Pray to God and no other option. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. All right. Anybody else? Samuel, Shivakumar, Solomon, Anthony, uh, go to God first. Share the matter to the person your spouse is accountable to and and don't involve family it may go worse and let god do the healing because sometimes it's not easy to forgive okay all right thank you i think Rin also said repent go for counseling okay so yeah so we you're right that adultery can be extremely damaging for a relationship right the person who uh, who has been offended the spouse who's been offended goes through immense pain betrayal, a sense of abandonment, uh, a sense of fear, uh, even the very fiber of who they are, their being, get so affected. And they do definitely need help. And they need support. And time. They also need time. And it, it definitely takes a lot of grace for the person who is offended to reconcile to this relationship and, and restore the marriage, right? Um, they need time uh, to 
for this healing to happen. And it's definitely not easy. Uh, there are, there, you know, I think through the practice of counseling, I do see uh, some make it through this. Some just find that they are not able to work with this pain. They try hard. Um, and, you know, some choose to go ahead and to keep, uh, keep, keep this act of reconciliation going on some choose to attend uh, to um, uh, um, annul the marriage they end the marriage okay uh, no matter what whichever way that the person who is offended uh, goes by uh, it is important for them to release forgiveness um, even though you know whatever has happened cannot be changed anymore so the offended person number one is to work towards having a heart of forgiveness having a heart of love uh, and being able to accept and love as the way god's god loves so it is important for the affected person to live out of that grace okay and we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the later chapters, which talks about overcoming challenges. Okay, and uh, it is it's important to, especially when moments of pain have been extremely extremely severe. Uh, and um, so it's important to come to a place of being able to receive forgiveness uh, and to. Um, I mean, sorry, to give forgiveness, to release forgiveness, um, to go through that pain, to be able to work with that heart of love. And we do understand that it's, it's, it's important that you give them time. And in this journey, doing this alone can, be, can, can feel very lonesome, right? But when you get the help of somebody, maybe it's a counselor or a trusted friend, or someone who, who doesn't add fuel to the fire, is always helpful. Okay. Um, so Radha has written something. Marriage is like a team. If the spouse is not able to meet all the needs and the other one is looking at his or her needs from outside, then will God hold both of them accountable for his or her unfaithfulness? Okay. Now, uh, it, it, it's true that uh, there are in marriage, that's what, you, you, and, and you put that rightly, you know, it's a team and you you need to meet the needs of the other. Uh, but something that we understand, we need to know that all our needs, whether it be, uh, our, all our needs is to be met in God. Now, there are some some needs in marriage that uh, you get you have from your spouse like for your physical needs but there are many marriages that go without these needs being met yes god will call you to be accountable for your works here right how we have been uh, whether we've been able to do our bit or not uh, and he he will call us out uh, whether it is to do with marriage or anything else, we have been called to fulfill the work of God, fulfill his heart, his desire, whether it be in our marriage, in our workplace, in our parenting, in our time of ministry, or uh, whatever he's called us to do. Yes, we will be called uh, to account for the things that we have or we have not done. So yes, that that will be there, right? I hope. Sri Radha, that answered your question. Okay. Um, now, when we're looking at... Uh, okay. So when we're looking at the the offended party or the, the person who has... Who's the offender? When we're looking at the offender, we are um, also... Uh, the offender also, just like the way God has forgiven him, needs to receive forgiveness and uh, uh, accept that there will be time that is taken by his or her spouse to come to a place of healing. 
and also choose to accept the decision that the offended spouse may bring, maybe either to stay with them or not to, or giving it some time of se separation. Uh, they may need to honor and accept that. And also um, uh, choose to continue to walk in a place of peace rather than retaliation, uh, no matter what, what kind of decision that the offended spouse would have made through this, uh, through this season. Okay. Uh, also, uh, for the offended person to go down and see the cause of what brought them to this, this place so that it does not become something that repeats in time. Okay, it, uh, it, it could be a place of lust, or it could be a place of selfishness, a place of pride, or, or wherever they are to be able to deal with it at its, at its root. Okay, now when you look at, um, uh, and this again, we're going to be looking again later in chapter 12, where um, uh, uh, even, as, even as the offended person makes the choice on whether to continue or not, the uh, the there there are two uh, there are two uh, what, what do you say there are two aspects by which a, a, a divorce is permitted. One is when there's adultery, and when there is abandonment, and there is scripture there for that. So if the offended person chooses to get away from the marriage, um, it is something that it is scripturally we understand is scripturally permitted for adultery or for abandonment. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, the, the reconciliation, as we know, is always is always best. But it needs two people to reconcile. It needs two to come together. Okay. Uh, we we do see that, uh, uh, especially we may have seen examples of how people have come. Um, come out of this this adultery infidelity and come out together and being faithful uh, to one another and that we know is the Lord's doing but I'm sure that their journey has not been easy and there's been a lot of grace that God's given so that this place of healing and reconciliation has come about okay uh, if uh, now in case a couple chooses to move away separately to choose their separate ways um, after this, as a church or as people who you may know, we need to be loving, we need to support them, encourage them to continue living in the ways of God and continue to helping them pursue what God wants them to do. There may be times that these hurts cannot be changed, it cannot be reversed, but we still believe that God is able to restore and redeem each person according to his plan. Okay, um, the next, uh, quickly, we're just going to look through uh, what are some of the fences, some moral fences or boundaries that is necessary for a couple to build up so that, uh, you know, we, so that we don't fall into, fall into sin. It's always better to be preventive than curative, right? Prevent whatever things that can happen rather than uh, being curative. That is taking, something has taken place and then attempting to cure the disease or cure the illness, okay? And we, we look through um, some of these principles or some boundaries or certain disciplines that are there in the way that one interacts with the opposite sex. So because this will go a long way in keeping uh, keeping you away from such uh, from from such hardships, from such afflictions. Okay, so you establish those boundaries in your mind, in your behavior, in your heart, in the way that you relate to one another. Okay, and it's important for us to see what are our areas of weakness, areas of vulnerability. So so we we are able to stand guard in the way that we uh, you know we we relate our affections and our appetites. Okay. Um, so let's just look at a few. It's to how do we keep some of those boundaries firm? And I'm on page um, 144, okay? And in the book, I'm on page 143. So let's look at each of them, okay? And uh, we'll go through them point-wise. So here are some practical ways to do that. So first one is to be able to maintain 
uh, fulfillment within your marriage, whether it be sexual, whether it be emotional, to be able to find joy in marriage, to find fulfillment in to in the in this togetherness okay and this is this is one thing that we were talking about preventive measures it's finding ways to stay fulfilled it is by either spending time together doing things together um uh, finding the joy in connecting and rebuilding back uh, one with another okay next one is uh being careful not to do anything that you wouldn't want your spouse to be doing OK, that if at any point of time you're doing something and you know that you don't want your spouse to do it is to refrain from that. Uh, next one is to avoid being away from sp from your spouse for extended periods of time. Uh, this is all especially uh, um, for those who may be traveling quite a bit, who who may need to stay long gaps away because of work or because of ministry, whatever, to staying away. It's important to stay connected with your spouse regularly, OK? If if you're a person who's working, not to pair up for uh, trips or uh, business trips with someone of the opposite sex, you know, just you and the other person, rather going out as a group. Um, so being careful not to pair up with, with that. So again, these are preventive measures, OK? Next is refrain from uh, going solo with someone right or either on a ride or on a coffee or on a lunch um, with the opposite sex uh, other than your spouse again going as a group uh, is is always helpful also be careful about what you're doing privately you know not no sense because there's so much that happens on on a phone you know, there's, there's a life that happens on a phone the use of social media or the way that we interact online with the opposite sex it's important um to be able to uh, to to keep it professional uh, to keep it just what is needed okay and also being open about um your messages or your mails or your passwords with your spouse always uh, keeps your guard next is to be able to keep a guard on your mind your thoughts your feelings and your affections uh, a lot of things start with the thoughts, right? The moment we begin to feel a wrong thought um, towards our, the opposite sex, it's important that we deal with it and uh, important to consecrate those, those that place, that thought and that affection, be able to cast out that which is not of God. Next is to be able to maintain internal boundaries, that is not uh, fantasizing, not taking time to think of somebody else other than the person uh, other than your spouse um, and being aware that the space where you're thinking is only kept for your spouse and you keep that as sacred right because when it it, it doesn't take too long to break uh, external boundaries if the internal ones are broken next is to be able to speak positively about your spouse in your conversation with others, all right? Or uh, to avoid giving compliments to those of the opposite sex. Or uh, uh, also to be careful about the way that you interact with someone. Suppose you have a feeling for someone or you have some sense of a liking towards someone, drawing a certain boundary in the way that you not just interact, but also openly expressing your feelings to the other person gives it gives it um, you know uh, permission sometimes okay being careful not to play with someone else's emotions not flirting um, uh, not not saying things that are more romantically inclined okay uh, also to keep away from pornography or other sexually related material now uh, uh, that can cause you to sin in that area okay uh, avoid giving advice or even counseling somebody of the opposite sex, avoiding discussing personal problems that you may have or with, with the opposite sex, things that, that may be very personal to you, sharing it with someone of the opposite sex can also um, uh, be, you know, get, get one into trouble. Uh, it's important to also cut off past relationships that you've had as you know, prior to marriage or in teenage or in early adolescence to cut that off so that there isn't, um, uh, you know, the, the temptation to reconnect and rebuild. And also to be able to establish any specific boundary that may be relevant to you, okay? So it's only we who understand and know 
what which space we are in and to actually cut that off and and not be in a place uh, where we compromise on anything right now this is just not for the married but even if you are a single person when you establish these boundaries right now you will be in a place of uh, being being uh, more mindful being more guarded even when you are married okay all right uh, so since we we've, we've We've come to the end of this, and we've spoken about establishing these boundaries. We looked at some uh, scriptural thoughts and uh, scriptural verses. We've understood certain instructions and what are some moral fences and boundaries we can keep. Okay, uh, just opening this out for any questions or any thoughts or any uh, anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, Pastor, this is a real life incident that uh, mm -hmm. from trying to help out uh, my previous colleague when I was working. So she just called me. So she is actually not working now. So her husband is working in a firm and then she helped her friend to get a job in her husband's firm. And now that she has sensed that something is not right between her friend and her husband. So yeah. she feels bad that she's helped her because the, her friend was really bad in her financial situation and she's done it with all good intentions. But mm. now that she's suffering, her marriage is suffering because of that. So mm -hmm. she's going through a lot of emotional trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I sense an emotional entanglement, but still both of them are believers. But I don't know how much they know the Lord or their spiritual growth is concerned. But uh, so how can we help in this situation? Because the other woman also, if she's expelled from work, she will suffer. But uh, it's like a real challenging situation and we've been praying about it. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so how can we help in such a situation? And this is something uh, both of them are aware of? I mean, the, the husband is also aware of? No, the husband is trying to be more secretive now because he sensed okay. that. So it's not out in the open, you're saying? No, 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 fast. No. Okay, so so I think the first and foremost thing is um, it's important to confront for the wife, to confront the husband, to really understand what is going on, right? Because being in secrecy, is something that really leads to further sin, right? So the first and foremost thing is to find out if there is something going on. So even if she's had an intuition, to confirm that intuition by, by confronting the husband on that, OK? The second is uh, now depending on how that response goes. Let's say he has. Uh, he has um, confessed. Then what we what we looked at is he needs to do what is on his part to severe that, right? Having someone, let's say a spouse, going through adultery and not willing to make changes in it is a red flag, right? So there may be times that the that the offended spouse may need to make certain um they they may need to make certain decisions right suppose there is like you said secrecy there is a denial it may be needing to involve someone maybe uh, like like a trusted friend or a spiritual elder or a pastor to bring this out and and deal with it um so that you know uh, whatever if there is something that's so obvious there, it needs to be dealt with. And of course, to, to help the wife through this process to deal with that pain and that uh, uh, the, the dejection or the disappointment that she's going through, to just keep encouraging and working. It gets difficult when things aren't out in the open or when there is denial or when people don't come out to really share the truth, that becomes really difficult, right? Then it becomes messy because uh, as a believer, you may know that your husband or your wife is in sin and allowing them to continue in that sin while you are in there, in there 
may not be a right thing to do. So doing uh, whatever is possible to, to involve one or two trusted people to bring about a confrontation to see if there can be any reconciliation. If there isn't, let's say the, the husband continues to deny but may have the affair, maybe there is evidence to it, the, the spouse should take a call on what she would want to see, right? And, and that may be different for different people, but she should take a call on, on whether you know, a time of separation would probably help for him to, to reconsider, right? Or, uh, uh, or, or to see if there's a course change. Now, this, this, this may be different for different people, but I'm just giving you an example that that's something that may be looked into. Because for the wife to be in that same environment where there is denial and where there is refusal to change when there is an evidence of sin can be extremely damaging for her, for if there are children in the picture for the children, it can be damaging. So to, to really be use that wisdom to step forward in what needs to be done till a healing and a reconciliation can take place. Jacqueline, yeah. was that was that helpful? Yeah, yeah, Pastor. My, my second question is: so, in such situation, we shouldn't help a person out of uh, good intentions. Should we keep it as a principle, Pastor? So, it's just like it's just my thought because if this person has not helped, then she wouldn't have got into the situation at all. So, 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 so Jacqueline, I, I, I don't see, I don't think that's true. I mean, okay. when you help people, you're helping people out of your good intentions. But it can be misused in any way, isn't it? Like, for example, you're helping your kids out of good intention. Maybe you're giving them something, but that they misuse it. So does that mean you don't give it to them? May not okay. mean that, right? But you're teaching. It's through that that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not because she's helped that he's getting there. I mean, this could have happened anywhere else as well. Right? This may not be the root cause of it. Yeah. The, the cause of it is that there weren't boundaries, or there were, weren't those fences that were kept. Right? That was that's the issue. It's not about helping and because this person came, or because I joined this job is why I got into this adultery. I mean, in that way, you can't do anything. You have to sit at home and you know sit locked. That, that's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. Makes right? sense. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Anyone else with any other thoughts? If not, we'll just close with a word of prayer. OK, let's, let's just close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us guidelines and practical understanding. Thank you that you have called sin, sin. And we pray that in our lives, we will recognize and identify places where we compromise, where we may just tolerate a little bit here and there, but Lord could lead us to uh, into the pit. Father, we pray that you will keep give us wisdom. Lord, you will give us a heart that's guarded, Holy Spirit, that you will work with us, Lord, to establish some of these boundaries. Father, we pray for people who may have gone through uh, much pain in their lives as a result of infidelity. Lord, you are the healer. You are the restorer. You're the one who makes all things new. Lord, we commit these couples, these individuals to your throne of grace and pray that your healing touch, Lord, will get into the depths of their hearts, Father. and They will be able to experience love and walk with a heart of love. Whatever decision these families have made, Lord, we pray that uh, we who are uh, the community around them will see them in love and not disengage or not ostracize or not stigmatize, but Lord, um, accept them with a heart of love and understanding. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, class. Thank you for uh, joining in today. We'll meet you next week. God bless you. Thank you.